Uh, welcome to the last colloquium speech of this quarter. Uh, we always save the best for the last. You guys know that, okay? So today is my greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Yimin Wang from Microsoft Research. Um, Dr. Wang got his bachelor degree from National Taiwan University, one of the best schools in Taiwan, uh, in 86. After that, he got his uh, master and the PhD degree from uh, University of Illinois Champaign, uh, several years in uh, 90 and 93. Then uh, he joined Microsoft after serving uh, for about one or two years in AT&T Bell Lab. Uh, in 2005, uh, Right now, he's the uh, deputy managing director of Microsoft Research, managing more than uh, 300 researchers uh, uh, there. And he was also the director of the Internet Service uh, Research Center. And their group invented many uh, useful stuff, uh, uh, widely uh, used either in industry, especially in the security or uh, um, uh, search engine uh, industry. For example, in 2005, they invented the Strider Honey Monkey. Uh, which, which is one of the de facto standards for, uh, for that industry. And also in 2007, he, they invented his uh, uh, Strider Search Ranger, which is one of the first search spam detector. Uh, that, that, that invention uh, was also featured in uh, New York Times uh, technology. And he's right now an IEEE fellow also. So let's welcome our speaker today. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, so uh, my name is Yimin Wang, and uh, I actually did my master's and bachelor's in signal processing. And then I became a fault tolerance computer systems person. I did cybersecurity, I did the uh, search engine, and now I'm managing the Microsoft Research Redmond with my peer deputy and uh, our managing director, Peter Lee. So today I decided to give a very different kind of talk. So I will give some technical talks project as well. But uh, I will not go into the detail. I present each piece of work to help you, especially the student, think about what kind of research career you may want. Okay, so this is kind of a looking back 10 to 20 years and looking forward 10 to 20 years. And my goal is, if each one of you can remember one thing I said in the next 10 to 20 years, then I'll be successful. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. It will be a discussion. If you are interested during my talk, you can ask me a question, or afterwards we'll have Q&A. Okay, and uh, some of you actually have done internship at uh, Building 99. So that's from outside, that's from the inside, a gorgeous building. So Microsoft Research presence, Redmond, Silicon Valley, New England, Cambridge, Asia in Beijing, and India. So these are the six labs. And, it, and the Redmond lab is the biggest one, 340 people, and then that's the size of the, the rest. And I, I just gave this talk uh, last week, at, uh, last uh, month at UIUC. But since then, actually, a couple of exciting things has happened. So we just opened a new lab. So there is a seventh one. It's not in the map yet. And it's in New York City, and they are doing experimental social science, algorithmic economics, and machine learning. Another exciting thing that we'll talk more is we actually just broke the world salt record. And I'll explain to you how we did that. And well, that was actually a very interesting experience. So they basically uh, now being able to sort one terabyte in under a minute using general purpose system. Okay, and that's a quite an accomplishment. Here's how we view our research. Okay, so this is basically the outline of my research, uh, research talk here. So on the x-axis, there's short-term to long-term. On the y-axis, it's reactive to business, company business needs to some more open-ended. And you draw four quadrants, and on the upper right quadrant is the blue sky basic research. And this is our main focus. We hire people primarily to do this part, and I'll explain to you, they eventually will get into the other quadrant as well. So here we call it search for truth and beauty, advanced human knowledge, climb a mountain simply because it's there and it's basic research. Now, after you've done research in industry for a while, you want to make an impact. That's why naturally people take their technology and they go talk to the product team and they try to find the biggest impact they can make. Sometimes there's a match, they make impacts. Sometimes there's no match, they go back to, to basic research. 
And it's in the long term here simply because it's an ongoing kind of thing. It's not like a, I'm doing this research in the next two to three years, I'm going to make something huge happen. It is something that Microsoft is a software company. There's always security testing, or we have a machine translation service. You continuously improve that when you have new technology. So that's why we call the tech transfer. That's actually a natural tech transfer model that we're doing every day. And almost every single Microsoft product has research technology in there. Okay, so that's also our activity. Now this one is a little bit unusual. This is called mission-focused research. And I'll describe that because I was involved in this. Uh, five years ago, if you remember, we had a search engine called Live Search. And a company decided that we want to compete with Google. And then they would come to us and say, search is a very researchy business. We need your help. So we just created a mission-focused internet service research center co-funded by product team. So this part is more like other research lab in a company, in other companies where the product team and the research team actually co-sponsor a center, and the goal is to focus on helping that uh, business. And we're proud to say that after five years, Bing Search is now as good as Google. So we can say that now. And I'll explain you how we achieve that. But again, we want to keep it in the low upper, uh, lower left quadrant, because as many of you know, that this one is very tempting. Once you show this to a company, they only want you to do this. Okay, and how do you protect the rest of the lab from this kind of temptation? That's a big part of the job we do. Here's another very exciting quadrant. It's called, it's short term, but it's open ended. The company doesn't really have the business threat. But we're asking a crazy question, and we want to do it in two to three years. Okay. And it's called expand human imagination of what is possible. It's different from advanced human knowledge. Advanced human knowledge means today we didn't know about this knowledge, and we gained this knowledge for the next hundred years. Here's more about with all the technology you know. How do you put together the technology in a way that can expand people's imagination of what's possible? Okay, so I'll use Connect as an example. That when somebody asks the crazy question, can we play a game without a controller? How Microsoft Research Labs actually responded and actually make something shift and big there. Okay, so that's the four quadrants. The first one, the upper right quadrant. This one should be the easiest one because all the research discipline we have belong to this quadrant. And you can imagine on the far upper right quadrant, the most, the most long-term and most open-ended is our quantum computing effort. So it's done in the Santa Barbara reporting into our VP. And they recently actually, their proposed experimental setup actually leads to a major discovery. So there is a big advancement in quantum computing this year. And that lab is a big part of that. The second one is theory group. And I put that in quote because I think at least up until yesterday, if you go to any search engine and you just type in theory group, you'll get Microsoft Research Theory Group as number one. Okay. And that just shows how well connected they are. We have a big uh, visiting researcher program. They will come in and then they will postdoc program. So they have a very big connection and very big research contributions to that community. And then we have large foundation by uh, other senior researchers asking very far upper right quadrant questions. At the other end of the spectrum, these are the fun things that you can see. And so here I use one example. You can actually go to YouTube and search for this. It's called IllumiShare and sharing any service. It's basically a projector and video combo. So that anything that got illuminated is a shared space by the two uh, remote players. So there you can see that the, the upper row of cars are dealt by the local user and the lower layer dealt by the remote user, and they can roll dice, and you can see it. Okay. And here, they have to solve this video echo cancellation problem and make it possible. Now, this is the kind of thing that every time they demo, everybody wants, wants one in their office. So we're now trying to work out how to manage factory things and how to actually give people this so that in addition to video communication, audio communication, you actually have shared space with anyone remote. Some of you are very familiar with this because Destiny Tang has been uh, collaborating with many people here. And skin put is basically using your skin as an input device to play Tetris to select menu. And they recently in uh, CHI, 
2012, they had a sound wave and human antenna. So this is just an example at the other end of the spectrum where we were experimenting with innovative user interface. And some of you have seen this. So printing dress, a pretty crazy idea. Just imagine in the future, you wear what you tweet. Okay, and just the general notion of if you are tweeting a lot about certain things, then you basically wear it with you no matter where you go. So even if you get away from t Twitter, you walk on the street, people know what you stand for. Okay, and here's a question that if we have that kind of society, how are people going to respond and how are we going to behave differently now that everybody knows what you are thinking about? So our management philosophy is, uh, some people say, well, uh, as a research uh, director at uh, Microsoft Research, the job is actually very simple. We only do three things. That's called hire the best people, give them the resource they need, and get out of the way. Okay, so once we hire the best people, we're not really allowed to tell them what to do. But we, we try to inspire them. So here are a few slides of how we inspire our people without telling them what to do. So in the first decade, we started in 1991, and the first decade is about getting to the best conference because it's hard, there's acceptance rate. I think in some security conference, it was 9% of acceptance rate. It's really tough. A system is usually between 10 and 20, still pretty tough. So how do you actually get into the best conference as the first step? In the second decade, especially toward the uh, latter half of the second decade, we started seeing best paper in the best conference. Okay, so I have an example of a sitcom. We have a strong networking group, PODI, we have a strong programming language group, and then SIGIR, the information retrieval group. So we are encouraging them to do best papers in best conferences. Entering the third decade, we are starting to see something that's even more different, as called the 10-year uh, best papers. What happened is you publish a paper 10 years ago. You may be the best paper there, you may not be the best paper here. But 10 years later, when they look back, they say, this paper is still relevant, and it is the best one. And of course, it takes 10, 20, 30 years to, to reach this stage. And now we are seeing, mostly in our database area, they are, the VODB is the best conference, Sigma is the best conference, and the 10-year best paper is not starting to come out. So when you think about this, it's from the best, to the best, in best, and to the best of best. And we encourage people to think big that way. And this is another way to think about it in a more concrete form. Some of you have seen this. And, and even for uh, graduate students who just started their research career, now I actually encourage everyone I talk to to download the IEEE nomination form. Because once you download it, you'll see section 7. It says, list the three most important items. And then part 2, they say, OK, 10 more. So now, if I ask you a question. So which paper is your most important paper? Your first paper is most important because it must be your best paper. So it gets into the top three there. Your fourth paper is very important because if it doesn't change your top three, maybe you should think harder to do something more, exam more important so you can enter the top three and kick the one of them into top 13. And your 14th paper is very important because if it cannot change your list of 13, it may not be worth doing. And then many of them, many of us here who have published more than four, 13 papers, we know that we almost never reference those papers. So you can imagine for some people sitting here looking back, maybe we spent a lot of time actually working on that, the other papers that are not very important. When you look at this list, three plus 10 is pretty much your research career. And I believe it's also true in the academic community and in inside Microsoft Research, when we consider people's career advancement, we don't ask how many paper you have. That's called the sum. We only ask what are your best papers. Okay, so this is one thing that uh, we firmly believe in in Microsoft Research Management. The research career is about maximizing the max, not maximizing the sum. Every time you want to add one more paper in, think about the max, not the sum. And here's just a story that I want to share. I, uh, one day I was packing and we are moving and then I have a whole stack of uh, moving boxes and they are all flat, they are all new. So I started uh, putting them together and I put my stuff in. 
And suddenly there is a one piece of cardboard. It's not new. And that really annoyed me because I thought everything is new. And then it's bent it and it's a heavy. On one side it's a heavy. And I put it to the other side, it says awards. And I was thinking about this. Who in this building they are so heavily awarded that they actually put this in a box? And then there is a label there that you see. And it's Butter Lamson. And he was the Turing Award 1992. So when you see that, it's like, wow. So not just the best to best in best to best of best, and then you have very best. Okay. And this is also very important that we find out that you want to be constantly reminded by there are people who have achieved way beyond you. That makes you humble. So whenever you celebrate something, you look at them and say, okay, I, after my celebration, I need to work harder. I may never achieve that, but I'll try to get as close as possible. Okay. So that's the kind of think big, think long term, think career kind of thinking that we are hoping our researcher would do. So now let's get more practical. Now after you do your research and you really want to impact people's lives and you know that there are only maybe 100 people reading your paper and if you want to influence, say, 1 million people, how do you do it? You can find some way to release your tool. You can find some way to join a startup. Or in the Microsoft product team, we actually have a lot of opportunities to do this. And this is roughly how we think about it. It doesn't have to all, always go this way. On the x-axis, think about 100K, 1 million, 10 million, $100 million investment. On the y-axis, you impact 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 to 1 million, and 1 million to 1 billion. Okay. There are four points in there. Usually when you have a single researcher publish a research paper, it's about $100,000 investment, 100 people will read the paper. What, by the time you put together a few researchers and developers together working on a demo, that we actually have an uh, annual tech fest demo where people show to thousands of product team members what they have done. Usually it's up to a million dollars, it involves multiple people. But if you want to actually impact 10, uh, 10K to 1 million people, think about it. You got to deploy, you, you got to maintain it, you got to support it. You need a team. So we can only pick a few of those big bets. And then the director needs to make a decision. I'm going to put a team of developers to work with you to make your research impact, impacting 10,000 to 1 million users and continue to support it. But if you want to actually reach 10 million to 1 billion, you have to work with the product team because they have the $100 million investment to carry your research result to impact the world. And I'll show one example. So Patrice, he is a programming language person. And he's been very active in the programming language conferences. So if you're in this area, you see many of the best conferences in there. And he keeps publishing. But then he finds out that if he continues to do research, he cannot make the impact he wants. And he found out that Microsoft is going to do something that's going to be a killer app of his research. So he moved to Microsoft Research and just applied that in an industry setting. And here's the problem. Each security bulletin costs Microsoft and its users millions of dollars. So it's important to find security problems. And there's a technique called black box fuzzing. Because a lot of security problem is about input parsing. So you have an input parsing routine that's not robust against security hack. Then by supplying a weird input, it can trigger. You can trigger the vulnerabilities. And do black box fuzzing basically means that you just randomly manipulate the input and hopefully you will trigger something. But for things like this one line, if y equals 13, then do something. And if that's a problematic line, it's actually very hard to random and then try to hit that line. So his research is all about guided execution. Okay. And now he has uh, done the work. He has uh, Im Im implemented in the Microsoft system. And now he actually can publish this to see, to show the world how big the impact is. So there is a CAC and March. 2012 article that you can read details. The key insight is very simple. And you will see that I will present the problem, the key insight, and the key impact. And that's the kind of question we ask. We don't ask about all the insight. We ask about key insight. We don't ask about what are the contributions. We ask about what are the key impact. 
And here's the basic idea of if you have this, and if count greater than three, crash, that's the part you want to test. If you input G-O-O-D and it doesn't crash, and it actually trigger the uh, inequality of each one. So what it does is it will start negating each one of them, try to go down a different path. Okay, so we'll do a symbolic execution and do a different path, and that's the basic idea. And then you, you, we have a very strong constraint solver, so you can actually say, out of all these constraints, how do I actually call this execution path? That's the basic idea, and here's the company-wide industry system. So you plug those red boxes into a bigger system that the company is using. So the third box there generate all the path constraints, the uh, all the possible constraints, and the, third, uh, the last box actually solve. Here are all the constraints. But there are many constraints, so you feed back here and see which one has more new coverage of code. And pick those one with the highest new coverage, then you generate more constraint, then you solve the constraint. And this whole system is helping Microsoft to efficiently test those file parser routines for security bugs. Here's the result. It, Sage is actually run, always run the last. That is, you have all the testing, you have the black box fuzzing, and then run Sage, and you still discover one third of all the security bugs. And when you think about this one third, if we didn't catch it, then every time we release it, it costs the industry and the community millions of dollars. But because they, can, they were able to stop it there, the impact is huge. And it's since 2008, it's been running 24 by 7 on hundreds of machines. And actually, have uh, more than 1 billion constraints processed to date. So, so that uh, application into uh, Sage is actually the largest computation usage ever for any SMT solvers. So we have very good solver, and we are also the biggest use of the SMT solver. And according to that article, it actually affects 93% of the PC users. So that's about 1 billion people. So this person, very strong researchers, he wants to make impact. He comes to Microsoft. He works with the product team. He makes impact on 1 billion people. And he's feeling, feeling very good about it. Now he goes back to do basic research. OK, so, as a, so when you feel that it's, it's, a, it's a very concrete way of advancing your career, and then you start doing your next stage of the career. Now this part, I will talk about search. And for those of you who are not familiar with search engine, this is the end-to-end -end search engine. It's actually a very interesting part. And some people think it's just information retrieval and machine learning. It turns out that's only about 25% of it. The other 75% is system infrastructure. So here, web pages come in, you crawl them, you understand them, you index them. On the other side, users submit a query, and you process the query, you try to understand it, and you do a matching with all the documents, and you rank them, and then potentially personalize them. That is the entire search engine. And of course, once you present to a user, user may click on number five instead of number one, then you know something is wrong, and you use that signal as a feedback loop. Okay. And this picture is very important because when you think about search, people only come to search engine to do search. But as more and more things move to the web, for example, now there's a lot of documents on the web. So every click, every menu selection is being recorded there. So you can view this architecture as online everything architecture. So there are things, information got gathered. There are user action that comes in. They present you with the best interface to help you navigate things. If you do something, they will feedback and correct their algorithm. Okay. So anything you can learn in this online service world, it's uh, actually very useful for anything online service. And search is actually the most, um, probably not the most complicated one, but the, the most mature one that you can learn from. And Chris Burgess is actually our uh, senior, very senior researcher in the machine learning area. And his machine learning ranker is the one that's running today in Bing's engine and it's about more than one billion query a day, hitting that ranker. And in the past uh, seven years, he has several versions of this kind of ranker. And every time he deploys something, it's two to three order of magnitude in terms of speed. And speed is also important because in this world, you always need to train. You need to keep trying. And so 
each iteration costs time, and the scalability is very important. So that's the part that Chris has in, contributed to. Sue Dumay, if you are in information retrieval, you're very familiar with her face, and uh, she's a National Academy of Engineering. She has been doing a lot of personalization, and, and here's something about personalization. Everybody thinks personalization is useful. But can you imagine if I personalize the results for every single one of you, how am I going to measure it? Suppose you say you have the world's best personalization algorithm, and once you deploy it, everybody's seeing a different result. How are you going to even measure it and say this algorithm is good or bad? So just in the past few years, they figure out a way to actually convince themselves and convince the product team. Now here's how you evaluate it, now we can go out. So now their personalization is actually driving a significant fraction of the Bing traffic, and this just happened in the past couple of years. I will focus on this part, because I personally have research in this area that I think is an interesting story. So that's our Strider logo there, and uh, for that about seven, eight years, I do everything Strider, starting from how do you manage your systems to how do you manage spyware, rootkits, malicious website, okay? And yeah, my product invention is Honey Monkey. This funny name turned out to be very good. Big people, you say Honey Monkey, people say what? And then you get to explain what that is. And honey means honey pot. And honey pot, as many of you know, is usually server-side honey pot waiting to be attacked, then you know that you have vulnerability. Honey Monkey is client-side honey pot. It's actually a browser that goes out inviting attacks. Okay, so the idea there is, right now, actually, you may not know, this world is being protected by honey monkeys. What it does is, the honey monkeys will go out, browse the web, prioritize those bad neighborhoods using an unpatched machine. So they will go there, and they will detect they got infected. Then they'll send in another honey monkey with a few more patches, and still test it and see if it gets in infected. So basically, sacrificial monkeys. And just keep adding more and more patch until the final monkey that have the fully patched machine go visit that website and still got exploited. Think about what that means. That means every single one of us could get exploited. So that will trigger all the alarms. That, that basically means somebody is exploiting a vulnerability that nobody knows about and is capable of infecting everybody's machine in the world. So, the invention of Honey Monkey is how do you detect things you don't know? How do you know the things you don't know? And it turns out there's an elegant solution there. So I'll leave it there so that I get you intrigued to maybe read the paper. And then I got into search spam using similar techniques there. And this is different. This is showing that for people who have been working in information retrieval for a long time, and they are trying to see if this document is a spam, and they just cannot get out of that box, cannot solve that problem. Suddenly, a system person comes in and says, why don't we look at all this thing, and why don't we detect it this way? And suddenly, the problem gets solved. So it's one of those cross-discipline kind of discovery. And uh, if you're using the search engine about uh, in, in 2006, 2007, there's a huge spam problem, especially when you search things like coach handbag. And this was actually started by my wife running upstairs and say, your search engine sucks, because I can't even find a coach handbag for your mom's Mother's Day present. So it was 2007 or 2006 Mother's Day. And, and what happened was there is something called spam doorway pages. They just create all these fake pages. And then they just find all the forums that they can spam. And they add a link, coach handbag this one, coach handbag this one. So all the search engine go there, and say, this content is Coach Embeck, Coach Embeck, very related, very relevant, and everybody is talking about this page in Coach Embeck, so this must be the world's number one. So they survey that as the number one search result. And by the time you use browser, and browser, there is a capability of executing script, so what happened is it says redirect. So you go to the web page, you don't even see the relevant pages. You just got to redirect to a page of ads, and that's it. And it was such a big problem, I list a few categories here. Some of them actually have 30% of junk. So can you imagine that kind of productivity hits on the whole community? So here's a key insight. Traditional browser is, st traditional crawler is static crawler. You go there, you take the page, you cannot execute the script. 
So you take it out and you analyze this page. And then you try to see whether this is a spammer's page. But when you ask yourself the question, what if the spammer just copy another page, exactly the good content, into the spammer's page? How does that characterize spammer? It doesn't. So what happened was we actually proposed dynamic crawler. And now the web is being dynamically crawled because a static crawler cannot analyze a program and trying to predict its outcome. You have to execute it. So dynamic crawler basically means in that redirection spam industry, that 1% of dynamic script actually redirect from a large number of spam doorway into a small number of domain. And those are the money makers because they, they need you to go there to click on their ads in order to make money. So that's actually where you need to go. And you have to use the dynamic crawler. And now the challenge is how do you take the browser and make it crawl the web in a dynamic way? That turns out to be a big challenge because browser is designed for individual user. Now you want to run in a server. There's a lot of optimization. So we spent the past two to three years just keep optimizing it to the point that we can crawl a significant percentage of the web. And this is the picture that when the information retrieval people are working on the search spam problem, they only see the first layer. So there are tens of millions of them and the spammers keep creating them and it's very hard to deal with. But they redirect to about tens of thousands of uh, domains. And then when you click on the ads, it actually goes through single digits of IP address block. Some ISP is making big money out of the spam. And then there are a few syndicator advertising companies, smaller ones, not the big ones. And they are actually talking to all the advertisers and say, okay, I'll display your ads, but don't ask where I serve your ads. And then they just spread on the spam pages. So these advertisers doesn't really know, nobody really know what's going on underneath because static crawler only give you the first one. So being a security person, and any of security person here, when you see this picture, you know that uh, you can only win a security game when your approach is more scalable than the bad guys. So first, we hit the second layer. We say, we are not going to care about wiping out the 10 million pages. We are, but we are going to dynamic crawl them so that if they redirect to any of these tens of thousands of known spammer domain, we are just going to cut it off. And so they, they can create more and you just wipe it out and afterwards they give up. And just that single technique drops the spam percentage by 30%. And, and that's the most useful technique at that time. But there's one more question that we were a small search engine at that time. So what? We remove spam from uh, live search. People are still spamming Google. My wife is still getting infected because of all these bad links out there. So we decided to do something different. We need to attack there because that's an even narrower uh, bottleneck. If you can attack there, we can destroy the whole industry. So what we decided to do is instead of keeping the technology in-house, we just interview with John Markov from New York Times. He happens to be interested. And we say, that New York ISP is the number one ISP helping the entire redirection spam industry. And John Markov actually called them and said, Microsoft Research saying you are helping the spammer. And they said, we are the New York's largest ISP. We cannot be in the business of helping the bad guys. And a few days later, they said, we've severed that relationship with the bad guy. And what happened is, once you sever in the middle, the whole industry got disrupted. Now, of course, they want to move to a different ISP. But what do you think is going to happen? You use the same scanning. So if anybody take this business, our next report will be, now it is this guy. So they actually have to go outside the country now because sometimes we don't have, we cannot reach outside. So this industry eventually gets pretty hard to make money and that's where the, 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 the bad guy will go away because they are in the business to make money. They are not in the business to compete with us. Okay, so this whole problem just disappeared. And so that's a very interesting way of thinking about from your research to the real, real world impact. There are certain things that you know how to do, and then there are certain things that you need to think harder. And in this case, it's actually helping our competitors as well so that the good guys can get together and beat the bad guys so that bad guys don't have money to invest to come back and bother us. Okay, so this is a security story. 
Now let's go to the last quadrant there, and it's an exciting one. And this, this quadrant has fewer good examples because it's hard. And I have to acknowledge, in addition to connect, um, the uh, IBM Watson system, where they say we're going to, break, we're going to beat world's uh, Jeopardy champion. Okay. That was the one of, on the upper left quadrant. It actually may not be in the advancing human knowledge. They actually put together a lot of the existing system and print out the one they don't need. But just doing that, they beat the human champion. And I'll give the Connect as an example. Uh, many of them probably seen Connect, I assume. And it's a way to play a game without a controller. And first, it has Connect for Xbox. Now, even more excitingly, it's the Connect for Windows. So now you think about uh, a few years from now, people, especially kids, will assume that if I wave, the computer is going to do something. Okay? And that's when you realize the world has changed. The, the people will expect your computer to respond to your voice and to your gesture. And you can imagine there are a lot of startups now exploring this area. And one of the examples I like the best is the uh, operating room, where you do some surgery, and then you need to flip through some images in order to decide your next step. But if you touch the screen, then you have to go wash yourself again. Otherwise, you cause infection. So here's an example of you can just wave, and you can see the image, and you can continue to do operating, operation. So that, that is one of the best uh, scenarios I've seen. And there are many, many people exploring new operations there, new, new kind of application. It's a Guinness World Record. So this one is the upper left quadrant, basically said, we're going to break the record. Now, it is a very good product. They also picked the right time covering uh, Christmas so that they are officially the Guinness record, 8 million units in the first 60 days. Okay. And that's a very good measure. Once you get on record, you know that you have achieved it. So in the upper left quadrant, let's think of it this way. There are three criteria. One is you've got to wow the world. So this one, wow the world. The second one is you've got to know when you have achieved it. Okay, so you ship it, you break the record. And the third one is every year you've got to know you're getting closer because otherwise you may drift forever. Okay, and this one, of course, they have measure to show that we are getting closer. And it created a billion dollar business. So now researchers are feeling very good that within a short time, their technology created a billion dollar business. And in the world, there are not that many billion dollar business. You can think about it, and your work is part of them. And it's a MSR worldwide contribution. So this is the exciting part. These people were not working together. These people are all working on their own research. And one day they come together and still spend about two to three years to make something big. So from Raymond, we have people doing, Ivan Tashav doing audio processing and speech recognition. From UK, the people working on computer vision and scalable track, scalable tracking. And in MSI Asia, they are face and identity recognition. And Silicon Valley guys has been doing a lot of large scale computation platform for machine learning. So it actually took all four teams together solve a lot of problems, and even a few months or six months before the shipping, we were still not sure whether we were going to do it. Because everybody knows that it's easy to put together such a system in a controlled lab environment. Very few people can say, I can do this in a robust way in everybody's living room. That's the hardest part. So that's why when this person this person is actually our hero. He's not from Microsoft Research. He's the general manager who shipped Connect. He's the one who came up with the crazy idea of coming to research more crazier than our researcher, saying, can we do this? And he's also been in the industry for a long time. And he said, every time you put 100 wicked smart people in the room, 99 of them are going to tell you that is improbable to impossible. Let me explain to you. I've been doing research for 10 years. I'll tell you, this is not possible. But fortunately, there's always one saying that this is unlikely, improbable. But it sounds so fun. Let's try to make it happen. And of course, he also got lucky. Each area, there's actually one person or two willing to do that. And eventually, they hit it big. So sometimes, knowing too much, then you won't take risks. So keep that in mind. By the time you become a world record, a world expert in one particular area, you got to always think about what if somebody else can do it because they did it. And you have uh, 100, 1,000 reasons why it cannot succeed. 
but somebody will make it happen. So think about that. So before you say yes or no, think about this 100 wiki people in the room. Okay. And this is another thing that actually inspired me when I talked to this researcher from Silicon Valley. I used to think researchers are most risk-taking because we do things that don't necessarily succeed, and therefore we are the world's most risk-taking people. This person said, no. What if you fail? Nobody's going to get hurt. Nobody's career is going to get destroyed when you cannot prove that theorem. So there's another way of thinking about risk. That is, researchers' life is actually very comfortable. The consequence is nothing. But for someone to come to research and say, I want to ship, connect, so that people can play game without using a controller, what do you think is going to happen if two years later he wasted billions of dollars and we didn't ship? That person's career could be in trouble. And for researchers who sign up to do two years, spend two years of his career, try to make that happen, if that fails, what kind of impact will be on that researcher's career? So that's the huge amount of risks. And he said, jump on it, because there are not that many opportunities in your lifetime. He jumped on it. After they shipped, finally, next to his little kids, he said, now I can explain to my son, that's what I've been doing for the past two years, and you are playing with it every day. So that's the kind of risk taking and the kind of satisfaction that you get at the end. Okay. This is Ivan Tasha from our Raman lab. And he says something else. He says, starting from 10 years ago, he always knew someday humans want to talk to computer without holding anything, saying start recording, stop recording. He said they just want to talk. And he never knew in what form it will appear. He just believed in that. And he's really appreciative because in the past 10 years, he has three different managers. And any of them could have asked him to stop. Not because it's not bad, but because there are more urgent problems. Actually, during those 10 years, there are all kinds of speech recognition, audio processing problems. That doesn't involve his main research direction. Any of them could have asked him to stop, but everybody said, well, we hired you. If you really strongly believe in it, just keep doing it, keep doing it. Until 10 years later, suddenly the connect guy come to us. And it's almost like he has been preparing that for 10 years. So when you think about it, it's unprepared preparation. You do basic research so that you have that capability. And one day you'll make it big. Sometimes you never make it big. But one day you'll make it big, and you'll find out you're the only one in the world who can make that happen. And it will happen in a big way. Now, there's another term called golden eggs. So after we shift connect, our manager can come here and say, finally, you know how to produce golden eggs. From now on, we just want you to produce only golden eggs. I said, we cannot. We don't know how to produce golden eggs. We only know that we provide them with the best environment, then that will maximize the chance of golden eggs sometime down the road. And if you like Connect, you let me manage this lab the same way. Basic research is important. Where you really need our help to step up, we'll help. The rest of the time, please leave us alone. We'll advance the state of art. We'll make contribution to the product on a going basis. And every five to 10 years, we give you something that nobody else can give you. OK, and that's the four quadrant. And we used to just have the connect example. Now this time, I'm so happy I have another example. So another example is, this is Jim Gray. And I was on that boat with him. He's a very nice gentleman. He has a very different style from Butler Lamson. Okay. And he's a, he's a Turing Award winner. And he's very friendly. And uh, unfortunately, he disappeared with his boat about five years ago. And this is a 1995 paper. At that time, it's one gigabyte per minute. And he actually said a terabyte per minute is our long-term goal, not misprint. Not a misprint. We'll get there. And it's going to be five to 10 years off. It turns out to be 15 to 17. But that is the long-term vision, and we've recently achieved that. So we actually broke Yahoo's record. Yahoo's record back in 2009 for general purpose cluster is they were able to sort half terabyte in under a minute. Now we can sort 1.4 terabyte. So this is the first time it actually broke the terabyte barrier okay, using a general purpose system. And it actually is 16 time efficiency. They use fewer disks and use fewer machines and achieved uh, three times as big of a record. 
So we hope this one record will keep us there for a while. And most importantly, we don't just break the record. We use the flat data center store storage. I will not get into the detail here. The publication will come out in the next six to 12 months. It's a data center technology that enables any processor to access any disk in a data center with the throughput of a local disk. So this is not just fine-tuned sort cluster. This is the general purpose cluster that says, if I can let you access local disk as high throughput, uh, remote disk as high throughput as local disk, then you don't have to worry about data locality issue. Then you can do a lot of things differently and sort is just one example that we demonstrate the power of this system. So you can imagine, although breaking the world record is something we want, the underlying technology and the kind of impact it will make could be historic. So this is something that we're watching. And I'll use this as an example of what a research lab can provide you. August 3rd, we have an inaugural Office of Director meeting. So that's basically the third day after I became a deputy director. And what we do is we invest resources in projects. So within a week, there's already a research manager bringing his people into my office and say, this flat data center store is really important. We got to invest. And during that discussion, something came up. They said they are going to break the world record. And I just couldn't get that off my mind. So, a few hours later, I actually asked that person, I said, a quick hypothetical question, because the resource is pretty tight. I cannot promise. I said, hypothetical, if I give you a developer, how soon do you think you can break a world record? And hours later, he said, six months. Now, if six months can break the world record, we will invest. So what happened is in the next week or so, I talked to all the people I can talk to. I give them two developers, and they break the world record in seven and a half months, not six months, but I'm very happy. Okay, so here's an example of, and here's another thread that I actually talked to Harry Sham, who is the owner of the Bing, the entire Bing search engine. They are also very excited about this work, so I, I could get support from him as well. So this is an example of, if you just have the research technology to publish a paper, you may not be able to break the world saw record. You need investment. And you need to find a place where you can have that investment coming in. And this is an example of an investment can come in in two weeks so that you can break the world record in seven and a half months. Okay. So that's also something for you to think about. Same kind of research with different kind of investment can have vastly different outcome. Okay, so I just have two slides left. So some people say um, happiness. There are three kinds of happiness. Pleasure is a short time, short term kind of thing. Engagement is a mid term, long, mid term kind of thing, and meaning is a long term happiness. And we find out that uh, researcher happiness kind of mapped to those three. When you first graduate, um, you think research freedom is number one thing. As long as you leave me alone, I don't care about anything else. Just let me do what I want to do. In about five to 10 years, you started thinking, oh, I've had my fun doing whatever I want to do. But I really want to have some ambition and some kind of bigger thing. I'm willing to sacrifice uh, freedom a little bit if you give me something that can help me succeed in a bigger way. After about 10 to 20 years, you start realizing that life is short. So if you're going to do something, you might as well change the world. Otherwise, life is not worth living. So you start thinking about, okay, I'm going to change the world, small way or bigger way. So the way we manage the research lab is we believe if we hire the smart people and we give them the inspiration they need and we just keep them happy. So every day they, they just want to come to work by themselves. And sometimes I talk to people and I'm not even joking. I actually say you don't have to come to work. You don't have to come to work at a certain time. If I never seen you, in the end, you come into my office and I just broke the world record. I'll give you the best performance. So it's completely result-driven risk-taking. That's the kind of environment. And like I said, productive researchers still need resource investment to change the world. And now you think about where in the world can you do all these things without having to move to a different company or organization? 
When you think about those four quadrants, you think, today I want to do basic research, don't bother me, and if I publish the best paper in the best conference, you'll give me the best reward. Okay, we'll do that. After a while, you say, I want to contribute to the Microsoft business product so that I can impact a billion people, and you do that, and you do a good job, so wow, we'll give you the best performance. And when a company needs us to fight search, we say, I will step up and I will help fight a search war. And when I succeed, you want to reward me. So we'll do that. And after a while, I say, I want to get crazy. I want to do something like breaking a world record. We'll say, we'll give you the resource. And when you succeed, we'll reward you in a big way. And they say, I want to go back to do research now. Don't bother me. I'll say, OK, great. You just keep moving in there, establishing all your connection, establishing all your credibility. And the more credibility you have, the more resources come in your way. And you pretty much do whatever you want, because you pick one quadrant. As long as you succeed, you can be there. So that's the kind of research environment we are providing to our researchers. And actually, there is a fifth quadrant. It, it doesn't make sense, but I call it the fifth quadrant. This one is also very important. And, um, and many of you, I think, could benefit from this size in the next 10 to 20 years. So there's four quadrants there. And after a while, the researchers make impact to the company, and they, they are not satisfied. They say, how about we just go to product team? So Jin Renzhou, on the, the one on the right there, he was a database researcher. He decided to join Bing team. And he's now the owner of the Bing's map reduced equivalent. He owns it all. And Dave Motz is a networking researcher. He was a very good networking researcher. He decided to move to Bing. He now owns the entire Bing data center. And Harry Shen was a computer vision researcher. And he, he doesn't decide to go there. The company wants to move there, uh, want to move him there. And he's now the owner of the entire Bing development. They are so happy they're having a career. They don't want to come back to research. We have a few researchers who try our product team and find out that's what I want to be in research. So they all come back. There are people who go out there and say, wow, I didn't know the, the product land is so, so happy and uh, so you can make impact there. I, I don't want to go back. And so I actually have a funny term for these people. These people are called accidental researchers. Some of you are accidental researchers. And it goes this way. You must be very smart. And smart people want to solve hard problems. That's why we become researcher to solve hard problem. And we are happy. And we thought that's what we were born to do. If you're smart people solve hard problems. You never know is, in fact, because you're smart, you can succeed anywhere, anyway. You just never try it. So you do research, you feel that's what you want. By the time you get in touch with product and say, I should have done this 10 years ago. OK, so that's called accidental researchers. If you're smart. If you have opportunity, try it out. You may like that even better than this one. OK. That's it. So we still have some time. And um, if you have any question, I'd be happy to answer here. Yes? Um, you had pictures of like individuals, like Susan and um, the other guy who worked on the search engine. But I assume you're working in teams in the yes. research department, right? So yes. how much is individuals off on their tangent? How much are these teams coming together? To yes, so the question here is a key question about leader of a project versus collaborator of a project. And this is actually a very important one. And this one, I think, is the most challenging one for any research manager. Because when you think about it, you want to hire the best people. Best people all want to be leaders. So when you hire all the leaders, they don't want to work on each other's project. How are you going to do big project? And I cannot say we have a perfect solution. But we just keep in reinforcing that these days, the great project, a lot of them come out of interdisciplinary. Okay. So you have two leaders in different areas. You two can collaborate. That's one thing we can do. Another thing we can do is we are actually trying to identify people who are very good at enabling others to succeed. And these people usually are behind the scene. It's just that every time they participate in a project, the project succeeds. You participate in another project, the project will succeed. They're never the project leader. 
But wherever they go, they succeed. We try to identify those people and give it a special place in our organization because you do need those people. Okay. So that's something we're still trying. And we have a, an explicit goal of our upcoming performance review. We'll identify those people and reward those people. And in fact, we'll use them as an example to encourage more people to do that. Okay. So that would be my answer. And I'll come back a year from now to let you know whether it works. Yeah. <laughs> Any, Any more questions? Question? Yeah, sure. You list these numbers, are those numbers of researchers? That's not support staff as well, right? So that's the core of researching Including researchers and what we call ISDE, research, software, engineering, software development engineering, and engineers. So basically, researchers plus developers. So I noticed uh, you mentioned that the people move from quadrant to quadrant. Yes. Um, but in rough numbers, what, what's the breakdown of the people in the different quadrants? Do you, do you know? Most of people are still in the upper right quadrant. Yes. And then they will not explicitly move down to the lower right because they publish paper, they talk to the product team, they do tech transfer for six months, and they will go back there. So there's no organizational movement. On the lower left quadrant, which is a mission-focused research, just to give you an idea, the Internet Services Research Center, uh, for which I was a director, we have about 25 people. So it's 25 people out of 350 people doing that kind of thing. So we are trying to control the kind of mission-focused research in under one-tenth. And on the upper left, we hope we have more. But the idea of wow idea is really hard to come by. So I would say that's less than 10 specifically working in that area. But I would like to increase that. Yeah, so that's actually our focus area in terms of trying to come up with great ideas. But during the connect time, oh, there, there are other projects going on. So I actually say about 20, about 20. Yeah, during the connect time, there might be 20. And then some people have moved away after connect. Some people continue on the next version. So it's kind of, um, I would say, one-tenth, one-tenth, and the 80% uh, is still focusing on research. Yeah. Uh, Amy? Yes. Uh, can you give our students some advices about if they want to join Microsoft Research? Yes. What kind of qualification, what kind of preparation they need to do? Yes, so usually the publication record and the recommendation letters are the most important thing. And in publication record, again, it's not about number of papers. It's about that one or two things that everybody will say, yeah, that's world class. I've heard about that. That must be a superstar. OK, so it's that kind of work that's most important. It's not any other of the uh, papers. And also, because as you can see, once we hire someone, we don't tell them what to do. So the bar is actually really high. So in preparation, you'll be talking to 12 people from your own area and from all the other areas. And you want to be able to have an intelligent discussion, conversation, with people outside your area. Okay, so that's also something that we're looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? Yes. Uh, out of those 350 researchers you have in Redmond, how many are doing actually the W research, like a hardware research versus a computer science? If, yeah, there, we if there are any, if there are any. I myself actually have a double E background, but now I'm doing mostly computer science. And we don't have a huge uh, hardware group. But hardware is an area we're thinking, because uh, these days it's about hardware device combining with software and services to make it a real uh, creative product and services. So we have a small number of uh, hardware researchers. We have some people doing sensors, so they are more hardware related. We have people doing uh, computer vision and other, and they are, they are from the WE background. But I would say most of them are still from computer science background. Yeah. Or we have speech recognition, of course. That's more WE background. Yeah. Any more questions? No. OK, let's give uh, Dr. Wang another big hand. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>